Okay. But the, I won't present in that time period. What? The poster is not until like the 22nd of August. It, it does matter. Okay. Because it's end of, it's end of the overall whatever. So we send a report in the six months after the, uh, how say it, the final date of the proposal. Okay. So a uh, side question. Since I have a meeting uh, at four here, five there, could Jabed go first? Or is he not ready sure. yet? Sure, please, go ahead. Because we don't have Erin and L London yet. Oh, yeah. Are they coming? All right. First meet right now, then. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Thank you, Jabed. No problem, it's fine. It's going to be short and not the interesting, I guess, you know. <laughs> Who knows? I don't include any questions. Oh. I didn't think that CCAST had a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, ADF or no, Amsterdam, whatever the one of the programs That's why that you had. I thought discussing two to to purchase this one. Yeah. Oh, to purchase. Okay, because I thought we had that for like a year and then it expired. Yes. The keyboard is expired. And the license is only for one year. You need to buy a new license. And they, are, year. they have a new version too, so... Oh, a new yeah. version as well, so the old will not work anymore. Yeah, they released the new version last year. Oh, hey, John. John. Oh, hey, John. Hey, John. Oh, hey. So, did you sign your official paperwork for the new place, John? I have not. Oh, you're still thinking. Wait, did you get hired? Well, uh, my understanding is that you got the offer, right? Did you? I, I did get the offer. Yes, okay. I did. Congratulations with the offer. Oh, thank you. So now you are trying to to think? You're still thinking about it, or you're just negotiating? <laughs> um. Well, there have been some serious discussions with my wife and I. <laughs> so, okay guys, so this one I'm going to talk about, it just actually, not I'm going to talk, it's a kind of interactive thing. So we are going to buy a, a new software but they have a lot of options in the market. They have some free software packages also. So that's why we are trying to find out which one would be better from the whole perspective lies, like price and available feature and everything. So in the first slide, I'm just with the uh, license price. If you look at here, uh, Turbo mode price is like $3,500. This one is a per, uh, license for permanent license, so we don't need to pay yearly or something like that. But the, uh, it's included for one year maintenance, support, and updates. So after one year, we won't get any updates or any support from them. But we would have a license, so we can use that existing code anyway. And for if you want to get the new updated versions, so that they have a one interesting thing is, and uh, they said that we, if, after one year, if we want to get the maintenance support and update, we need to pay 20% of the license price. <laughs> so we need to pay 20%. Have any questions, Levi? No, I don't think. I think it's just... No, not yet. It could be a feedback. Oh, just yeah. some, yeah, some noise like this. <laughs> so, and if we, if there have any gap for updated and uh, existing license, so we need to pay 20% for each year, or we need to pay for new license, which one is a smaller in that case. And for ADF, ADF is pretty costly. They have a lot of options for ADF license. You know, they have, uh, we can buy for fixed core or unlimited core. They have option also. Uh, floating core, floating core means we can use that in any different course. 
and for this price is for unlimited uh, unlimited code for a one year license 4500 after one year you won't get anything so it's fixed for one year by the way about GUI uh, do you remember how many of nodes which uh, have in uh, the graphical uh, kind of type of uh, or not on the Ccast like which allows this GUI thing GUI thing is for local machines. Ccast doesn't have X server. No, running. I think they do. This is a new, like, they were updating it in a, this group meeting. Oh, uh, maybe then I'm... Meeting. So yeah, he kind of mentions that they have really a very small number of nodes, but they actually oh. upgraded, like, when they were upgrading the Ccast, okay. they also upgraded for the G, GUI, or whatever you call it, GUI, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever the application. So GUI, GUI software is for just, uh, like, gas view for just things here, for video writing purpose and creating the new software and just things here. They put this one and include it. But if we want a GUI for RDF, like Gasview, we, we need to pay $450 more ex uh, extra. And since this is a one year license, there are no questions about upgrades and everything. After one year, you are done. So, in the, in the license price perspective, Tarbomul is far for that. And now, the question is that Tarbomul has all uh, feature what we want, we want to calculate. And this is just a comparison to, uh, list one. I just few uh, something and DFT transition is DFT is common. So DFT software and DFT, DFT and for transition state calculations. And I look on the top of also for they have a uh, you can calculate the transition state by this method, transition state reaction coordinate methods. But in, in RDF, they have a three, four different methods like Nazi elastic bed models, eigenvector, eigenvector following methods. And, but these other methods also have ever been bus, I guess, Nazi elastic bed models. I don't know about the other one. And for the most important things, what we are looking for, that's the relative and the relativistic corrections on them. And in the RDF, they support the Zora corrections and also the two component relativistic corrections. And in Tarbo mode, they only support the two component relativistic com corrections. This is yeah. the same as WASP is supported, right? Two, two, two component relativistic effects yes. or whatever you yes. call it. Yes. The X oh, to C, that's what they like. call it in WASP. Non collinear. Non collinear, okay. This is the same thing, right? Okay. But the difference is that this is really for the time dependent <coughs> calculations, right? So not for the ground state, but you can really add yeah, this we can add effect when you do uh, TDDT and mm -hmm. getting excited state calculations, yeah. which again different from... For Zora calculation, it will support just like ground state energy and also uh, no one in TDDT is included only spin orbit coupling, not the relativistic corrections. Well, spin orbit is relativistic. I mean, in, in that, but Zora it's have not a all, all yeah, or not all, yeah, Darwin or all that effect here. Mm -hmm. So, in Zora, it's only in ground state. In excited state, only spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. For solvent effect, and they have a, they have a lot of different solvent models in the IDF. In the Tarmo, they have only one cost model. And but I don't know exactly. All of them, and just put this whole list here. For dispersion corrections, and um, they have a DFT, um, yeah, DFTV, not DFT, DFT D3 methods. But for ADF, I didn't found exactly at least uh, any dispersion correction or not. They have a DFT D3, I guess. But they have another different software like for DFTV and all other packages. Yeah. So in other words, you need to buy a new, another DFTV. edition. DFTV packages, to, yeah. To include kind of more functions more and functions, more yeah. DFT methodologies there, mm -hmm. okay. So, and that's also like price like 1500 to 1000, I guess, uh, 2000, yeah, I guess. So, and main difference, uh, what about the constraint DFT? Is it supported? And um, I didn't find as spe specifically they mention anything in the uh, constraint Nizer? DFT in the Nizer list. Then? Uh, no. Then if they're not mentioned, probably it's not. Uh, maybe it's mentioned in some other list. But it, they have one list all of the feature, but I don't constraint DFT. 
and and for basic set, one basic difference of these two. Well, like I would probably yeah. say, like I, I know I didn't kind of ask mm -hmm. you to do it, but there's also another software N W yeah. chain, right? Mm -hmm. Which also kind of allows for calculation of the uh, pretty much the same, and mm -hmm. it's free. Yeah, I, I look. Yeah, that's why I, I put that information on the on the next uh, slide. Actually, so for N W M games, both have a Zora calculations too, and both are free software. But again, it's only in the ground state. Yeah. So for TDDFT and for TDFT and NW can also support the spin orbit coupling and excited spin, in spin flip transitions. So it will give us the spin flip transition energy too. And NW NW can also have the constraint DFT. So in that comparison, if you compare the NW can other two, NW since NW NW is a free and also we have NW can in all systems. Pedro bad. Mm -hmm. Do you know if uh, ADF or TurboMore can do like transient absorption simulations? Transient? Uh, I'm not sure about that. No, I don't think so. Okay, because I I saw a paper I, which I thought used TurboMore to do transient absorption calculations. I send you a list of this uh, a link of the uh, feature of both. Can you go to that link and check on this one? It is. It's, it's, it is supported it, in the same way as you were trying to use this with Gaussian. Remember, like from a from some uh, yeah. code for this guy. So even if it's supported, it's supported pretty much in the same level of theory, which you already know. It's not sufficient, unfortunately. You're not getting you're not getting enough transitions to get to the visible range. Right, because it's okay. excited state transitions. If you have very mm -hmm. dense spectra, if you have or uh, your excited states are kind of very dense, the splitting is very small. Then, of course, you're getting the lowest transitions, which are in okay. the infrared and which they don't measure with the, with the spectroscopic properties, because they measure only excitations at the uh, visible range. Right. So, so and uh, this means you need thousands, thousands of transitions, which of course means again you need to create a huge matrices, which just not feasible in this methodology. So even if it does, okay. it probably does. TurboMole is known. I, I think I think it was the first software which is doing this. Again, maybe it's in a development mm -hmm. version or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's kind of should have this feature. But it would be in the same level as it, as you already tried with Gaussian, not, not better than this. Sounds good. And another thing is in the TurboMole, it supports the molecular dynamics, but we have molecular dynamics software, but I'm not sure, I don't think it's a very important here. But ADF is just for DF, it doesn't can support the molecular dynamics. And another thing is in ADF, they have a some feature, uh, two method losing to calculate. But if we go molecular dynamics transfer, yeah. again, you can run excited state molecular dynamic in this case. Yes? You can optimize the excited state. Yeah. It's adiabatic, but it's in a, like you, you can optimize excited state with turbo mode. As a, as we do in the Gaussian, mm -hmm. yeah, but but this one is a according to molecular dynamics at the higher temperature, like here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So, and in the they have uh, another feature in IDF for calculation of charge transfer, like current uh, current flow and other things, by using the two different methods available. One is a green function based method, and another one for charge transfer integral methods. Yeah. So, in terminal, it doesn't have. If a you talk about CT integrals, I think it should be constrained DFT then. What is the charge transfer integral? You can create in like again the main idea of constrained DFT is that you kind of assign yeah, the problem. density, saying that some portion of density should be localized on mm -hmm. this part of the molecule, another part uh, part part of the density localized on the other. And you're not allowing, oh, how say, like with this, like adding mm -hmm. this additional constraint, you optimize the overall ground state and so on, right? Um, and and then of course you can think about kind of you know applying this constraint DFT to the excited state or to any other kind of things. I'm not sure what exactly they mean by this. And this one, I guess they are doing like uh, in they have some graphical uh, presentation. They are showing something like charge is localized on the two. I mean two. Differently localized and it's it's 
transferred to the like bulk or other connectivity, something like that. So they calculate current. Yeah, yeah. It's a the, current calculation. Mm, they also the they, Yeah, they also uh, for oh, gain function see. method they also able to do the current or charge okay. flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It I mean it's a dynamic charge transfer, not yeah. Kinda like that. In other cases, it's almost similar. It's uh, only one thing is not available in terms of that's Zora corrections. For this one, as I, as I said, uh, the Zora correction is available in the two fee software. Both was available in our cluster. And another thing is molecular dynamics have available in Tarmo, but we have one of the molecular dynamics software like Buzz. So they have, uh, uh, I was asked to talk about actually the relativistic corrections, about the Zora corrections and the other methods. But unfortunately, I don't know any uh, much about either of them. So in that case, in this one, I just uh, put the two very uh, basic equations for the Zora corrections. So we know that this uh, relativistic correction is coming from the Dirac equation. So we can they have uh, three different parts. So and Dirac equations also uh, Dirac equations derive from the two component system. Is a, so in the, in the first order corrections, I took this original paper and. So these are the two functions or do we need to define based on the two and they are real and these two functions are can be related with the, this uh, this uh, operator the chi operator is it given to that is chi not chi I mean this operator I mean they have one relation is not Whatever. And so for the two component, our way, our main purpose is to remove, I mean, replace one component by other one and then found out a Hamiltonian who it will be the uh, computationally feasible. So what is the difference between phi and chi? Yeah, there are one is positive, another one is a negative in that case. Is a one what is the interpretation? In physical interpretation, like electron and positron. Okay, or electron and hole. Electron in this case, yeah. In this case, yeah, you turn and hold. And they also have a two part for each of them, in total the four, four, four components. And it's four because, why? Because of the spin, right? I guess it's not, it's maybe, spin, yeah, it's, it, it's because of spin, yeah. All right. And this sigma is for uh, poly uh, matrix. There's a potential, they have a two, uh, two, uh, two component, phi and chi. And then for some simplifications, we will get these, these equations. And then if this Hamiltonian, we will get the zeroth order regular approximation zero. From here, <coughs> this is a, a whole term for uh, Hamiltonian. And then if we approximate zeroth order, we will get this first two term here. So that's why it's known as zero order regular approximation of Zora equations. So this one, and the other thing is they mentioned that this one, this calculation is very specifically based on the uh, selective uh, basis set function. So they have, a, uh, they have a reasonable basis set in the IDF. They mentioned, specifically mentioned that for almost, uh, high, almost all of these elements. And another corrections was the double component corrections, and I didn't put anything on because I, I went through the theory and there were a lot of things I didn't understand there from here. And but one thing is that in the double component is saying that because since they are in in Dirac function, Dirac equations derived from the four I mean, two components and the plus minus in total four components, so two components is converted to the one component. That's why it's known as a two component one. I, Exact component to one conversions. And these two about this them here. So this is a kind of a brief comparison between the two these two software. And we need to decide that either one we want to buy or we can go to the free software available and WK. 
Gjemit? Gjemit? Istru pëmë instovë të nërsk? Të gjithë qekë? Are you check that out? Again, because it's not a free software, it's not even if it's installed. Yeah. Yes, you need to buy if a license. Someone, yeah. the, the, the question is, uh, if you buy a license, would you be able to use it on, on NERSC? It it's a uh, group license, so price is the same if you want to buy no, here? No, no, question just, is it installed there? Because if, if you don't know, it, it's fine. I don't know the okay. install or not, but if we want to buy, then we need to buy as a group license too, or but there isn't, they have no discount or anything like that. But ADF, ADF, they don't have, if they have, we cannot use because it's like fixed core, even they, they mm -hmm. have a fixed core and floating core options too. They're very selective too. They're so that's all from my side, yeah. Doesn't look like Turbo Mall is on your screen. No, thank you. It doesn't have? And I'm not really seeing anything. What was the other one? ADF. ADF. It doesn't look like that's on there either. Is Amsterdam density functional soft simulation packets? I don't know. Yeah, it's not showing up. But it's not a surprise because, again, the software requires a license every year updates. So even if someone is installing it, to support it every year with 4,500 mm. is probably too expensive. So that's why it's probably appearing, disappearing, and yeah. Uh, plus, this is of course used mainly for the molecules, which again, I'm not sure that this, again, for, for NERSC, it's more kind of used for large scale, mm -hmm. highly polarizable kind of type of calculations, which again, uh, chemical calculations probably, I mean, calculations of small chemical molecules do not fall to this uh, kind of approach. So what is your conclusion? What do you think would be more useful, let's say, if we have resources? From the features, I think that we can go for NWCAM since we have NWCAM as a free software. Well, NWCAM is a free software anyway. We're getting it anywhere, right? So uh, nothing nothing to choose. I mean, mm -hmm. it, by default, they already installed it on the SICA, so we will have NWCAM software anyway. But I'm saying about these two guys, if we, if we have, again, resources, right? So which of them would be useful or you think would be more preferential to have? And it seems like IDF is more user-friendly from the, if I am browsing their own website. Really? Because things. based on your kind of notes, it's, it's required, like it's having so many options, which means you probably losing your user-friendly <laughs> oh, okay. in, in <laughs> approach case, yeah. because you really need to choose something and you always need uh -huh. to know what to choose. Of course, you always can just go with the default settings. Mm -hmm. But it's give us more options, then we can do the more uh, with the more different methodology and whatever we have all of different options in this case. And but Tarbumul is better in that sense. Tarbumul is their permanent license. We don't need to, if we buy ones, we can use the same code for. Like um, you said, oh, well, that sounds for update. One After one year, we won't get any update or anything. But still, we have we won't get any support, any update, anything. But we will have a. Or like Gaussian, yeah. What do you mean by Gaussian? Gaussian is not zero nine. We we don't we don't get their update update version, but it's still Gaussian zero nine. We can use for longer than yeah. But I think it was for one year. Can you go back? Yeah, one one year for maintenance, support, and update version. Yeah. So after oh, one year, after one year, if we want to get uh, want them update uh, any update or their support. We need to pay 20% for 20% of the original price for each year. But if they if they have any gap, we need to count them three four years. Or, or we need to compare with the total price which one is smaller, which one is lower. We need to pay that one year. But we will have this core. We can use this core permanently, original one. But in ADF. After one year, everything is gone. Hey, so any ideas from Los Alamos group, from Levi specifically? I think I like Turbo just because you don't have to buy it year after year. Uh, the nice thing about ADF is they do spin orbit coupling. 
However, I thought when Pong was doing spin orbit coupling for like Dr. Soon's projects, which I know that's not the only reason why you would want spin orbit coupling, Dr. Soon said it didn't really change the overall spectrum. Right? Well, it depends on the complex. And it did. Like we, yeah. we have in this much, it, it provides much better agreement with uh, low energy transitions. Like it's really shifting into the red. Okay. I, I, I never saw them. This was just word of mouth from her. So it, she might not have noticed it or it might paper. not have been. It was a shown. paper published in 2017, I think they published it. And uh, so this uh, comparison is in the supplemental materials where you can or clearly see the difference. Yeah. So the difference is, of course, small. But this tail, because usually in experiments they have very long kind of tail, which we usually don't because our uh, peaks, even if we have like weekly allowed peaks at the lower range, right? Uh, so they're really discrete and like you really don't have this nice tail. Oh, because of this period. Yeah, because you have really one or two states with very low intensity, right? Uh, but when you include the spin orbit, then you actually have real transitions, which kind of provide this really dying tail, pretty much similar to what they see in experiment. From qual quantitative point of view, yes. Qualitatively, you see the difference. I mean, backward. Quantitative. In terms of numbers, it gives you the difference. Uh, in terms of just quality, it's, 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 it's not very... Uh, important, but it was for that complexes, right? We have, we still have several things which, and uh, and again, we're not talking about absorption. We also want to talk about emission, and for emission, uh, even if you don't optimize the excited state, right? So kind of getting the right splitting rather than just taking a triplet would be more reasonable. Okay, I guess we're done, right? So let's thank Javed. Is there no any other source ideas? <laughs> okay, thank you, Javid, once again. Yeah. And uh, next presenter is Roll Over from previous meeting, yeah. London. We should uh, see be it. Before, proof. <laughs> before, yeah. before we start, uh, let me attract uh, attention and invite everyone to congratulate. Fatima and uh, John on uh, the MRS advanced that was accepted today. <laughs> um, I guess before I get started, there is one mistake on here that I noticed. Uh, I claim that the D e term here is the exchange correlation functional. It's That's not correct. It's uh, contained inside of that E. It's like the only part that you can choose, I guess. Um, So yeah, I guess uh, I'm looking at uh, perovskites and titanium dioxide, uh, the reason being that they make efficient solar cells. Um, well, before you go to your methodology, right, mm -hmm. I don't think you, you, you really don't need to explain people what is DFT, since you're not really developing new functionals or anything, yeah. so what's the purpose. But what you absolutely need to introduce your dynamics Right, yeah, right. I, I still got to... And I'm not sure that it's really a kind of reasonable idea to put half of your space, more than half of your space, to use for, for explanation what is DFT, and right. have really very small, kind of reserve very small space for your time, for, yeah. for your dynamics, not about your dynamics calculations. So, And there was a yeah, presentation so from Fatima, right? You, you were showing some formulas in your presentation last mm -hmm. time, right? Uh, for for your dynamics part, right? Mm -hmm. So you can probably <laughs> share. Respect for the borrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably just copy paste. Yeah. <laughs> if she would be not against this idea, yeah. so you probably can just take your approach and take in your formulas, maybe modify it slightly, uh, rather than just going through what what is DFT. Right. No, I, I was just kind of trying to work through this stuff and make sure that I actually understood the process here and. I don't know, I, I'm definitely going to have to be a little bit less verbose with it, but I'm also thinking that it might be a good idea to go four columns, basically leave these two alone, uh, do methods as its own column, because I'm going to have a ton of equations to put, and then underneath the motivation I can put the references and acknowledgments. So that might make it a little bit 
cleaner, a little more efficient in the space usage at least. Um, and you will not have space then for you. If it would be four columns instead of three, mm -hmm. you're reducing the space for your figures. So you will be not able to put this size figures then. Your figures will be... Yeah, but I mean, I can also smaller. squeeze them together, right? I mean, these ones will be much more pronounced once I actually kind of neglect this whole region where there's nothing going on, right? I can, I got room that I can squeeze those together. Um, I, it seems like I could make a little bit of room. My only concern with that is really this part right up here. Um, I feel like that might get a bit scrunched if I do that, but I haven't actually gone through and done it yet, so I don't know how that's going to turn out. Um, yeah, so... Pretend that you are presenting it for the first time. Let me give a quick dry run. Um, So I'm looking at what uh, what differences are made by changing the ligands on the titanium dioxide nanocluster. Um, so in one case I have hydroxyl ligands adjacent to the perovskite, and in the other case I have acetate ligands adjacent to the perovskite. Um, if you look at the orbitals here, you can see that there's actually uh, the LUMO, or sorry, the HOMO is localized on the perovskite while the LUMO is localized on the titanium dioxide. And in the acetate example, they're both completely localized on the titanium dioxide. So this is not preferable for a charge transfer process. These are backwards, by the way, so imagine that these are flipped just, just, just again, am I right <laughs> that now you're really looking just on two systems? That's, I, I don't think that I could put more than that on the poster and okay. still have enough So technically you can see that in both systems you have your same surface for the, uh, for the, for the perovskite? Yes, the perovskite is exactly identical in both cases. Uh, the only difference is... Can you zoom in? Like yeah. this area? It's a type of ligands and maybe number of ligands in your titanium dioxide um, system. Yes, and also the orientation of the titanium dioxide nanocluster. No, but this again, you're not oriented. Uh, did you orient it for purpose, or this is how it ends up after optimization? It started differently oriented, I'm pretty sure. I guess that was a while ago, so I don't really remember exactly. But, I mean, even if it were, if, if this one were to be oriented but, but, but the, the same way that this when one When you say is, different orient it means with the hydroxyl you have how many structures you have with the hydroxyl? What do you, you mean have, by structures, I guess? Well, you said you have different orientations, so you have hydroxyl with different orientations. The, okay, so the hydroxyl... Are you talking about different orientations of hydroxyl versus acetate structures? So, essentially, the structure of the titanium dioxide, you basically have like two rings of titanium oxide and then sticking out of these rings, you have the uh, the acetate groups. They kind of stick out like the rim. But the hydroxyl groups stick out of the face right here. So in the perovskite case, this face is adjacent to the perovskite. But in the acetate case, this part is adjacent. OK. So then it's not really that you're looking on the, uh, for, because when you say you also look on a different alignment, right? It means you have an exactly same system with whatever, hydroxide or acetate, and you just kind of rotate it with respect to your surface in a different angles or different mm -hmm. surfaces to see how this orientation will change the electronic structure or, some, or, or dynamics or something like this, right? So this kind of change in the orientation is kind of naturally comes due to the difference in your ligands. I believe so. I would have to look at the actual original. So technically, you really have just two really systems to compare so far, right? Just two systems. That's all I'm looking at for this poster. I, I feel like it would get horribly convoluted and very complicated to try to talk about anything okay. if I included. So the you have other two systems, systems which are different with this titanium part. Do they have the same amount of titanium? Titanium, yes. Uh, the so like the core of the nano cluster is the same. Uh -huh. The the only actual difference is. Um, so, okay, so you can kind of see that you have uh, like a titanium oxide ring here and another one down here. I would say you have better probability representation of your structure on the top panel where you're showing the dynamics mm -hmm. because uh, orbitals really close everything. Yeah, here. And if you make it even larger, then I guess we, we clearly can see this, uh, what you're talking about. Okay. 
So in the hydroxyl case, the only real difference in the structure is that down here you have hydroxyls, whereas in this case, and keep in mind that it's shifted like this, um, you have isopropanol ligands sticking out at the side. Can so, you show what is isopropanol? Uh, let's see, are any of them here? This guy is an isopropanol right here. That's a clear one. John, do you have proof that it is isopropanol? Mm -hmm. Prop is three carbons, right? Or is that butane? Just show it, please show it once again and ask John. Including the oxygen. Otherwise, it would be propane. <laughs> would it be, right? Naming? So, like, yeah, there and up. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see. So, you've got an oxygen um, stick at least on my carbon, screen. And then the carbon branches out in two directions with one more carbon on each side. Okay. So, that I think should be isopropanol, according to uh, how much chemistry nomenclature I know. <laughs> yes. Cool. Approved. <laughs> If you look at the absorption spectra, they're almost exactly identical. The only difference is that these uh, these little peaks and wells here are just a little bit more exaggerated in the acetate case. So you're probably not going to see any real difference as far as the light that's being absorbed. Um, this is uh, just a schematic that kind of describes the, in a very loose sense, the charge transfer process. Um, so this one is a hydroxyl. This is the acetate. The figure that I had is just in the other order from what I did this in. Um, so, in the hydroxyl case, the the band edge of the perovskite, or at least the lower band edge, is uh, uh, is that a good way to say that lower band edge? That it kind of seems like that's talking about this part. Anterior orbitals may be better to say. Yeah, the anterior. Yeah, it's, I mean the homo. But you, you on mean the, just the top of the valence band and yeah, bottom of the conduction? Yeah, be better to say. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> right now you're acting as professional. It's too long, it doesn't. <laughs> so yeah, the, the top of the perovskite valence band is higher than the top of the titanium dioxide valence band. Um, so when you do excite a charge and it eventually relaxes to its lowest state on the conduction band, it's going to be localized on the titanium dioxide. So you will actually have a charge transfer occurring after the photo excitation. Whereas in the uh, acetate case, you don't have that same band structure, so it ends up exciting, but no matter how you really do it, you're going to end up with your electron and your hole both localized on the titanium dioxide. Yeah. So there are band structure and everything, almost, and charge distribu distribution is completely different, but why their absorption spectra is very much identical? I mean, I would imagine it's because they have almost the same composition and they're in close to the same conformation, or at least the perovskite is, and that's the major light absorber, so. Um, an aesthetic dipole also should be different in the both system because charge distribution is very localized on the acetate system. I don't know, I'm just curious. I don't know why absorption spectra is very similar in yeah, I, I don't know that I could give you a good reason why they're that but similar. They but they have slightly different gaps, right? I would suggest probably, again, you have this free space in between your figures. You can probably right. just make, yeah, you can, even if you're not, uh, really, if you use the same format of three columns, probably you can make it a little bit elongate your figures, right? Mm -hmm. And show the band gap so we can see the difference. Because I think last time you were mentioned, or maybe somewhere, in your previous presentation, you were mentioned that there are slightly different band gaps. They're not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The difference is not huge, but there is a no, little bit different. No, but there is a difference. Right? Yeah. And maybe for the uh, spectra, you, again, you can uh, show with transitions, since you have really just a single, single line, mm -hmm. you really can show your transitions. 
which contributed oh, to yeah. the spectra. Yeah, that would be a good Or one. at least you yeah. can show the vertical arrow for your lowest energy transition. To show because if your vertical line would be kind of in a very edge of the spectra, it tells that your low state is optically inactive, right? Mm. And then we can clearly see that maybe the first will be kind of inside your spectra, means it's already in this tail, not very active, but at least more active than the other one, right? So up to you, there are two ways. You can either really show in these transitions, and then it would be like vertical lines of mm -hmm. different heights, right? They might be too dense, I don't know, maybe they look not very good, but you can, you can play with them. I could them. at least put like the peaks in there, at the least, I mean. Yeah. Or you can at least show just the lowest transition as arrow, and again, depending where it's like, like, located, located completely in this dying tail, or kind of in an in a age where it's having some uh, contribution, right, will tell us whether your low state optically. Because uh, I think Jebet is saying that in case of hydroxide, where you have, this, I, I forgot which one is which one. In one case, you have charge yeah. transfer yeah. character. Yeah, yeah, it's this one that I have. For your, ex transfer, for your yeah. home aluminum transition, for the other, it's uh, completely hybridized, right. Mm -hmm. right? So, and we assuming that those which is hybridized should be probably more acti optically active than this completely charge transfer character state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. But hybridization is not the only parameter which dictates the uh, strength of the oscillator strength. It also depends on the symmetry of your mm -hmm. wave function, right? Mm -hmm. Because depends on how this wave function is rotated and overlapping with the electronic like hole and electron wave function, right? So if they will be hybridized but kind of at different angles or whatever, right? Due to the symmetry, they might not give you the uh, significant dipole moment. Okay. But, 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 but intuitively, the hybridized state is supposed to be more optically active rather than completely localized on a quantum dot, uh, or whatever you call it, titanium quantum dot and the perovskite. Okay. So and again, you either see it, you might you might really see this, and we will see that this low state is completely dark in one case, and maybe some of like maybe not very bright, but at least with some optical activity for the second case. If not, again, it, it it's not necessarily the case because again, the symmetry of the orbitals is might be might be all. despite the hybridization, the symmetry of orbitals might also kill the transition dipole moment. In the bottom, I mean, the last figure, is that schematic diagram or this quantity that function? Schematic, Oh, yeah, it's just schematic. Yeah, no, it's not. Oh. I was trying to look on the what the energy difference on the pink color. Yeah, I, I, I could, because I'm going to have to remake this anyway, um, at least to some extent. So I might make it actually to scale or something, but I don't know if that would really be worth it, I guess. Um, so, okay, so I guess moving on to the excited state dynamics. But, but um, if it's a hybridized state, why your diagram for the hydroxyl? Hydroxyl is a hybridized, right? The acetate has both of the frontier orbitals on the cluster. Oh. Yeah, the schematic is like switched around from the way that it should be on. Ah, poster. okay. Yeah. Because I was completely confused. <laughs> so, so in the next iteration, you will swap them. Yeah, yeah. I just have to either like cut and paste it and try to do it, or just make a new one. No, just swap. You drag and drop. You can pull figures through the through the poster, right? But this is all like one figure, I guess. So I'd have to but like yeah. cut, 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 cut and paste. Like, cut and yeah. But don't forget, because this is making it's very confusing. Oh yeah, yeah. Because That's why I put this little note right here, so I can't forget. <laughs> well, I guess no one will understand. Yeah, swap it. Yeah. <laughs> and cutting, cut and paste it much quicker than redoing. Mm -hmm. So I guess any other questions on that? So, uh, moving on to the excited state dynamics, um, I guess the ones that I'm showing here are the, the uh, excitations with the highest oscillator strength. Um, and can you show now, on, since we have the spectra now, can you show yes. what exactly is energy you're talking about? Like in these peaks for your spectra, where do you excite? Second peak or first peak? Uh, 
Um, I don't know because I didn't go back and look at the actual excitation. Well, the game this might be useful. Please do, please do. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Might be useful, and but, uh, you there, can show the arrows time, on your spectra so. where you excite. Right? You can put against the arrows or some kind of mm -hmm. nodes to say, oh, we excited this peak or in between peaks and so on. And um, can you finger on the absorption spectrum? Uh, One of them, just finger. What about it? Just finger anywhere. <laughs> Higher? Okay, enough. Uh, there is a sub, there is a peak. Yeah. Can you label each peak, which uh, orbital, which pair of orbitals contributes to the peak? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it shouldn't be any problem. Good. And what then you can, it, it will, um, you make a set up for easier narration later. Mm -hmm. Remember, <laughs> this labeled peak, it is where I am exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Having this character, we're so, exciting so the So set up traps going. for your hunt, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the band gap of this system? Fast system? Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can just add up three number and give some. It's around three you don't walk, right? Yeah, they're, they're on pretty close to three. I think. I think this one was just a hair over three, and this one was like three point two or something like that. I'm not really sure. I would have to look again. Um, yeah, somewhere in there. But also recheck your spectra. Mine is, it's, it looks too similar actually. I think Jabet is right. right. It looks too identical. So maybe it's just a, like what you think is hydroxyl probably is acetate. You just duplicate the same spectra twice. Maybe. Recheck it. Okay, yeah. Or maybe I... you, you plot it incorrectly or something. I would definitely recheck files and maybe redo it. Very quickly on a GNU plot or whatever, I don't know how you plot it. For, on the, the, po for the poster, or maybe uh, only for your own confidence, do the same, these two plots on the same panel, so that they, like two lines on the same mm -hmm. figure, and see if they coincide or offset a little bit. Okay. Because right now it looks too identical. Right, yeah, the only difference your, that I can your, really your, tell is that your, this your valley kind of dips down a little yeah, lower. Yeah, your dose is definitely down. showing much more difference. And it's really surprising to see such a similar uh, spectra. I would agree. I similar, not only in the low state, but even the higher state looks very, very identical, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and if your whole energy is 1.2 and electron energy is 1.55 and band gap is around 2.5, total excitation energy is around like 4.7, 4.8. Uh, I guess when you say relaxation energy, are you referring excitation energy? Oh, excitation energy is around four point seven, four point two, four point yeah, maybe four point eight. You can see numbers there. It's on the exact amount. And then I add to the band gap, so it's around like here. I can't see any numbers here. Yeah, so okay, yeah. So the hydroxyl excitation is. Oh wait a minute. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're excited to the Lumo Tartan Plus? Yeah, it's it's a little over three. Um, definitely not three and a half, though. Yeah, they're both oh. a little bit over three. Then it's made me confused. Then is if band gap is like around 2.5, or you said more but, than 2.5? But, but, but your band gap is at zero Kelvin, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is after oh. running okay, MD, okay. and then, yeah. It's already at the room temperature averaged over, is it average kind of over ensemble? Are you averaging it? Yes, this is using the okay. Redfield tensor. Um, Which already kind of introduced yes. this idea of averaging over ensemble. Right. So I guess keep in mind when looking at this figure that this is actually one of the hydroxyl ones. I wasn't able to get the acetate ones working. I just recently got uh, all of my couplings done for the spin restricted ones and I was trying to get that to work, but my computer did not like that very much. Um, so, yeah, I guess this is actually a, a plot of the the charge transfer happening in time. Uh, so the Z, or sorry, the Y axis is representing the uh, the of the orbital, I, uh, it's, uh, it's got to be a good way 
to say that. Or we of the system or something like that. Yeah, because I mean, it, what you do is you integrate over the, you know, like the x and the y dimensions in the actual model, I guess. And then to this the tells you what the electron density is at that height. Yeah, I should think of a good way to say that, I guess, because that's... Um, so yeah, it, when you start out, you can see that there's not really any charge separation happening. You kind of have like electron hole, electron hole, you know, just kind of layered up in the perovskite mostly and pretty much neutral in here, which agrees with the, uh, the picture of the orbitals that I plotted earlier. And as time goes on, you can kind of see the electron shift up to here, and you still have some dark spots or holes down here. Or a hole, I guess. And uh, after about 100 femtoseconds, I believe, yeah, it's about 100 femtoseconds, you have a completed charge transfer. Where it's entirely localized on the titanium dioxide. This one is also a charge transfer, but that's not for this system, so don't worry about that. <laughs> that's just more to see what it would kind of look like. You look confused. This is both a charge transfer. This this plot is actually from this system. I I didn't get this one working oh, when okay, I made okay, the okay, uh, okay. yeah. These were just taken Sorry, from yeah. an earlier presentation, and I tried to get this one to work today with uh, all nine hundred ninety nine couplings, okay. and that my computer crashed after about two hours. <laughs> oh, this you mean like it's, it's not the real data? It's kind of a fake data. It's, it's real data. It's, it's a different excitation over here. All the other stuff in this column is good, but this one is actually hydroxyl. You just ah. feel the space here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of at least plot out where things will be. So, well, I guess I should maybe leave those up there. So I got these ones lined up like you guys said I should, and you know, it looks kind of nice. Um, I guess I don't really know what I want to say about it. Um, this shows the the oh, energy oh, oh. of the uh, exciton. Is it for electron, your top plot, is it for electron or for, for the hole? Both. So the, the bright yellow is electron density, and then like the darker blues are the hole density. So like there's actually a little... But then initial, here. then where is your electron density at the initial moment of time? Oh. It's kind of smeared out over the perovskite, so you kind of have it like above and below your top layer, kind of, a, it, it's sort of above and below the layers, which... Then why is it not yellow? It's... Why is it not bright yellow? I don't understand. Because it's not really localized in one specific spot. Oh, it's spread over the whole layer. So yeah, it's... yeah, so if you look at this, I mean, it's kind of smeared across most of the layers. I mean, it's most strongly localized I guess in the top layer, but it's it's pretty well spread out, so it's not really dense in one uh But then I'm a little bit confused with this uh, colors. Can you return back to your color plot? I am trying. Like your holes they go from dark blue to what? What is your color scheme? To the light green? Like like this so is becoming completely doesn't make any sense, right? Because you're going from, like, you, if you're using different colors mm -hmm. for electrons and holes, right, and you're saying, you're saying that this change in colors represents a, I'll say, dec change in a charge, cha it's, charge density, right? Yeah, I mean, you so could then, call it then, electron then density, going, guess, going, going hole from yellow to blue m makes no sense at all, because blue stays for the maximum of electron. Your hole becomes a, a, an electron. No, no. This makes no, no sense. Physical no, blue sense. is maximum positive charge, right? Dark blue is Correct. Yeah, positive. Correct, yeah, yeah. The darker, yellow like the makes darker blue negative. purple is a positive charge. It's the lack of an electron. So to avoid confusion, you may, uh, I, I do see that you have added the color bar. Yep, yeah, so but I've got this part is, here. Which you need to have two different color easy. bars. It is not so, so you think I holes. should have? Two. And it with is a clear difference in the color scheme. And this could be not sufficient because people, uh, right now we are spending like an hour, mm -hmm. but uh, actual visitors to the poster will spend like five minutes. Right, at yeah, minute. it's going to be real quick. So uh, highlight and write by text, um, blue, very positive, green, neutral. 
orange negative just and, and make this uh, mm, keywords already covered like in green in green font okay. green is neutral in blue blue is positive okay um, I have another question on your second image. It, mm -hmm. That is that's the correct one, right? Yeah, that I one mean, is actually right for the bottom. acetate. This is the only one that's not actually okay. acetate. So what is the initial state? Lumo plus ten and final state is Lumo, right? Yes. So what is the energy difference Lumo plus ten and Lumo? Uh not very much. It's uh But like if you go to the table below that. I don't actually have the excitation energies on there. Um, not excitation energy, just you they were listed as a loom whole energy is 2.91 and electron uh, energy is 0.9 those aren't energies those are relaxation rates oh so that's kind yeah, of like minus. the slope of this part right here i guess oh okay my bad sorry i thought yeah. it so you can write uh k sub e or at this part if you tell that it is a slope just add a label yeah to, to help to digest. That, yeah, seems like a good thing to do. Because I do have, like, a lot of room still kind of left, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not, I'm thinking I could probably put the, uh, like, the legend as far as these, probably right in here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and here you can explain color codes by words. Mm -hmm. um, so, I guess we'll move on to this part. Um, I, I guess I haven't really changed these since the last time I showed them. Um, but So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to chop out this whole part uh -huh. here because it's not necessary. And then that will kind of make this whole thing a lot more visible as far as what's actually happening. So, okay, so this axis represents time. So as you move forward in time, you know, this is kind of the height is your occupation of uh, whichever electronic state. And the this axis tells you which state you're actually occupied in. So that's, I guess, the reason why these are discrete is because you don't have a continuum of states. You have discrete states. So, I mean, as you can see, as time goes on, you uh, the electron is less likely to be found in the initially excited state. I forget which one it was off the top of my head, but uh, it kind of migrates down and down until it eventually is entirely in the uh, would you agree or would you consider that this set of figures would go much better before your colored figures? They could, yeah, because that would actually explain kind of, yeah, that would make sense because that would uh, give sort of an introduction as far as like which states are kind of involved in this whole smeary bit. Because when you do, when you would add all equations, uh, the equations for the colored figures are just occupations multiplied by some uh, distributions. Mm -hmm. So the occupations are more like core information. Yeah. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. Um. And why you plot it to 150? If you plot up to 50, maybe it would be a little better. It's just the way that the script is currently set to run. I tried to, so basically I need to- You can change uh, the axis limit, right? You know, you click on the figure and then it, it gives uh, windows to change the axis. If it is, if you are still in, in MATLAB. Uh, these are not saved as MATLAB figures. These are just saved as like PNGs. But you can run MATLAB again and then modify the figures. Right, and I tried to do that with the acetate model today with all the couplings. Um, but after two hours, my computer said no. So I uh, decided to try other things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I need to be able to make the Redfield tensor before I can do this script. Oops. So yeah, I was not able to get to that today, unfortunately. That was kind of what I had planned. Um, so these graphs are showing the same thing, except instead of electrons, it's the whole occupations. Um, and as you can see, I mean, it's a pretty similar time scale. There are differences, but they're not huge. Uh, and then this is some of the data that I threw together really fast the other day. Uh, 
picoseconds in verse is maybe not the right unit. I just wanted to put something there so I don't forget. No, no, that that's right. That's right. Okay. Right but do do you see any trends? Can you tell uh, uh, the correlation between excitation energy and uh, rate of relaxation? Like, if you excite higher, would it would it relax quicker or slower? Seems like there is a loose tendency to follow the energy gap law. Um, would it I be, mean, would this it one be, should uh -huh. have the highest relaxation rates according to the energy. Uh, well, actually, no, this one. Potent well, yeah, but either way. I guess this one has the fastest whole relaxation rate, but the electron relaxation rate is definitely not the fastest. Did you try to plot this data? In, in represented in graphical form? No, I have not done that yet. Uh, same as, as Fatima did. Can you try it and mm -hmm. then some trends may become evident. Yeah. Or, or may not, but it's it's worth of trying. Right, yeah, and that, that might be a better use of space than trying to cram a table into there. Yeah. So, it seems like if your ACDR system is very dense on uncoupled orbital compared to the hydroxyl one, because the energy difference of the LUMO 10 to LUMO is very, very small in compared to the LUMO plus 13 to LUMO in hydroxide. Right, yeah, and if you look at the density of states, you do actually have quite a bit more going on in the uh, conduction band here. So, Just, what about got, the like, relaxation right the So, bat. isn't it, if the uh, band is highly dense, so isn't it supposed to be Relaxation rate shouldn't be higher than compared to the other one? I would think that if you have a higher density of states, the relaxation would go quicker. Quicker, yeah? Yeah. But in the table, it's showing then the other one is a 1.29, and this one electron is 0.9, smaller than the other one. I mean, I see hydroxide. Yeah, I guess I don't. I don't know why the electron relaxation rates are slower for the acetate. Um, I mean, the whole transfer rates or relaxation rates are definitely a lot quicker. They're significantly faster. But uh, I'm not really sure exactly, I guess, like what physical, physical reason there would be for these to be slower. Um, oh, wait, actually. Is it number? Well, I think about number it, the whole is, relaxation is rate number? should depend on the valence band, which doesn't really look a whole lot whole, different. Whole, whole density is almost similar in compared to these two figures, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's really not much difference. Is there any chance you switch the Whole density? So, I mean, uh, the, the valence band density. Wait, 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 not wait, wait. whole density, sorry, yeah. So like the structure of the valence bands are almost identical. I mean, it's kind of the same thing as with the uh, spectrum. So for Actually, valence band, like it, should, it, should, it should be approximately the same for both models, for electronic, uh, for it, rate of relaxation of electrons. Mm -hmm. It's about a picosecond. But for, for the holes, the acetate model is about twice as quicker. Probably because uh, the uh, hole states are localized on uh, titanium dioxide were um, there are a lot of nuclear degrees of freedom from ligands and they facilitate relaxation. Yeah, that, uh, I would agree with that. Um. So I guess I will move on to the conclusions that I drew from the data that I showed here at least. Um, so, I guess, I don't know if you can actually see it or not. Yeah, you can kind of see it. If you look at the very edge of the perovskite and the, uh, in both models, you can see that this one is actually slightly attracted to the titanium dioxide, whereas this one is repelled a little bit. So that would probably make this the more stable model, which would be much better for solar cell applications because you don't want it to degrade over time. Um, by the way, what are the binding energies? I don't know. But you, you did try to compute them in the past. 
Did I? Okay, you can. I, I honestly don't remember. Because you're talking about binding between the, yes. the Perot Sky and the Nano Clusters. Yes. And I don't recall calculating that at any point, but I guess I, I don't really know for sure if I did. have enough time to do it. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is still kind of, uh, this is just sort of like where things are going to be, how things are generally going to look. Um, maybe you already mentioned that maybe I missed somehow. Mm -hmm. How many hydroxyl group and how many acetate group in your system? How many? So there are three hydroxyl groups. Um, so, okay, so like each little like ring of mm -hmm. the titanium oxide is three titaniums and three oxygens. So you basically have one ligand sticking off of each of the titanium. Okay. So you'll have either three isopropanols sticking out like the sides of the wheel shape, or you'll have three hydroxyls, and then are there six? Yeah, there should be six, I believe, uh, acetates in both models sticking out the sides. Oh wait, that's not the one I want. Uh, would you let me just talk to John for a second? Yes. John. So uh, the model that Vanden is using is one of your models with uh, uh, polyoxytitanate co uh, with titanium-6 coordinated mm -hmm. by six uh, acetate groups and six isopropanol groups. And mm -hmm. later on, three out of six isopropanol groups were either removed completely or replaced to uh, hydroxyl groups. So you can make any comments or suggestions to London based on this. Well, so um, one of the things I had done was initially take this small pyroxotitanate cluster um, and remove these ligands one by one from the titanium sites and recalculate the energies. So you could look at how binding energies of you know a single ligand versus a doubt, a, two of them versus three uh, would give you some type of total energy change. And so you could look at just your single polyoxotitanate um, with all six of the same ligands, calculate it, run a single point with two of them removed, calculate it, and then you could rerun a third system that has these three hydroxyls pointing down towards your surface. And so you would have, you know, the effect of these hydroxyl ligands on the total energy of your polyoxotitanate cluster and then you could just run the slab by itself, compare those energies, and then you'd have binding energies for all, you know, two of these different clusters and the surface. Okay. Yeah, I definitely never did it like that if I did ever try to do it. So, um, if you look at the band structure, uh, which is that schematic that's right over here, um, that suggests that the hydroxyl will be the superior model again, uh, just because it actually encourages charge transfer instead of, I guess, fast recombination. Um, the electron relaxation times, which are kind of the ones that are more important in this simulation, um, are slower for the hydroxyl model, which is, again, a good thing, because that means that it'll take longer for charges to recombine, which would hurt your efficiency. Um, so you want longer lifetimes. And then uh, the whole relaxation times are quicker for the acetic acid. Uh, wait, are they? Yeah, they are, yeah. I think that I uh, spoke there. Yeah, I did. Oops. Hmm. Unless I switch these pages around. But you can uh, double check it. Yeah. For the next time. Right. If, if there will be a next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that I uh, got these backwards. Oops. What? Yeah, I guess it's uh, kind of... I have a conceptual question about your conclusion. Mm -hmm. So, like you saying, the hydroxyl ligands lead to 
long uh, electron relaxation times. My understanding, I would probably rephrase it slow electron relaxation period. Right? Yeah. So longer time was... means it's slow. Right. <laughs> so, and then meaning longer exciton lifetimes, which is favorable for solar cell applications. So the last part, right? So meaning long exit on lifetime. But the second part, I mean, the very last point mm -hmm. is that acetate leads to slow hole relaxation, which yep. means holes are much faster in hydroxyls. Mm -hmm. Exciton state includes both electron and hole. Yeah. Right? So your electrons leave longer, but your holes leave shorter. Mm -hmm. So the exciton by itself probably is not really living longer. So I would probably rephrase this excitation. It just means that you have your electrons living longer, nothing else. Not If you have slow both in electrons and whole dynamics, yeah. then you can say, yeah, overall exciton life is much longer in this system rather than in the other system. Yeah. But you have electrons is less than twice faster but holes, I mean slow, but holes more than, actually twice, like in some configurations, it's really twice faster in the other system. Just be careful with the word exciton. People, yeah. people like Professor Kruszewski and his uh, former or future students will give you, like, will give you a hard time <laughs> if you use it in a wrong context. I would definitely yeah. rephrase this last meaning, if you want to really have this meaning, so take out long exciton lifetimes, right? So yeah. You already said that your relaxation time is longer, is uh, slow. So, and then say, which my favor, the electron transfer processes to the leads, right? Because your electron not really resulting back to the low state, mm -hmm. but can kind of transfer it easily before it's reaching the lowest band, right? Yeah. To the, if you have contacts, to the contacts. Or take it out completely, because I would say it's it's not really it's not really true to say that it's really favorable for solar cells. Yeah. Since your holes are much faster. Well, it would be the the slower one that would determine it, though, right? Well, you didn't compute it uh, lifetimes. You didn't compute the. Recombination. This is my another question. Control. Did you calculate recombination times? No, no, I haven't. Or you you just you making this assumption? You have the data. Maybe you don't realize it, but in the data that you possess, this data is included. Okay. But you didn't bring it up and you didn't analyze it. Would that have been in the same script that got me, like, oops? Just the... All of these figures? Uh, uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, if you look on the Redfield tensor, which you mm -hmm. also can show here in the poster, uh, the element corresponding for relaxation between Homo and Luma, it will be uh, the Even your rates for your, uh, recombination. recombination times. And it will be substantially slower than all others. All okay. others are like of the order of one inverse picosecond, and this one will be of the order like... Um, Times smaller. Okay. Yeah. And again, go back to your table, just like maybe a typer or something. If you use k here as rate, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm then thinking. Then the that units should be not in picoseconds but reverse picoseconds. Oh yeah. I so if you report in time, then probably <laughs> through <laughs> <a little> inverse. <laughs> 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 I, I threw in a very crappy yeah, little like minus one and just copied and pasted it. Okay, here it is not, but. In is not so it's rate for sure. It's not time. It's not one point twenty nine picoseconds. It's one. It's it, it's yeah, rate. It's right. So, so when you're so to get the time, I need really to take one divided by one twenty nine and get the number for the time. Uh. Mm -hmm. One divided. By yes. Yes. Oh, to get the characteristic time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then it looks like. In all cases, you're getting something really sub picosecond uh, relaxation rates. Yes. Mm -hmm. And even like some in some cases you have more than two, so it's actually less than 0.5 yeah. picosecond. Yeah. For the for the holes in the second uh, table, uh, it, it is like 
300 frames a second. Is it reasonable to have sub picosecond time uh, rates for the relaxation in these systems? Because my understanding yes. is that usually in a, well, at least in a semiconducting quantum dots, it's picosecond range, actually. Yeah. Not sub picosecond, picoseconds. Up to 10, from 1 to 10, right? Pretty much the same as in the semiconducting materials, bulk materials. Not very different. Just so uh, I don't see the reason why uh, is it dynamics much slow in perovskite, uh, much faster in perovskite, or what? Uh, much faster. Is it really sub a second range for perovskites? If you just look on the uh, relaxation in bulk, and again, this is Oleg Presh that probably has already published this data. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's, let's ask, ask John. Oh, maybe John already <laughs> calculated it. So in, in your yes. paper with uh, perovskite quantum dot, what is the uh, cooling, electron cooling rate and whole cooling rate? Well, in the quantum dot, it yes. was more than a picosecond. But in some of the bulk calculations from literature, they were measuring on this, you know, time scale of a few hundred femtoseconds. Hundreds? Few Fem hundreds. hundreds of femtoseconds, yeah. So you have in again a problem then because your perovskite is a bulk here. Yes, yes it is. So a few hundred femtoseconds, and it should be. Uh, and your hole is on a perovskite, in both cases. Yes, yeah, so I'm. I mean, they had relaxation for oh. holes and electrons at like 450 and 700 femtoseconds, unlike some of the initial um, time scales for relaxation. 400 femtosecond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a sub picosecond range. Yes. Oh, okay. So then it's comparable. Yes, I haven't read. It's a right order paper, so I, yeah, I, I don't recall seeing these rates for a similar system to what I have. I guess so. I don't know. Well, with quantum dots, again, you look just on the titanium dioxide quantum dots. Probably mm -hmm. people also have that on this from calculations or experimental. And since your holes really localized on the perovskite, then the relaxation of holes should be pretty much similar to the perovskite, uh, regular perovskite systems. Yeah. So, again, something nice to compare, especially with experiment. And if it's really in agreement, it would be a very strong point because this immediately justifies your approach. Yeah. So I'm just wondering one thing about your model. So I don't know the 3D conformation of your system. Is it possible to make this system to connect it to the more number of acetate ion instead of one? You could. Um, so if you kind of look at, of course I have the cursor in the So is it really one? Or it's more than one molecule. Like this one is pretty much just the one that's pointing straight down at it. That's how so it How is your 3D action. conformation? Is it possible to make it more? Yeah, so you have another um, acetate right there. So that would be, what, 60 degrees, I guess, between these two approximately. So you could get them both down, kind of. It'd be, they'd be sitting more on like the edges of the perovskite, which I guess wouldn't really matter that much because the perovskite is just a, it's a cutout of like a slab. But that could change your dynamics maybe significantly, maybe, see? It could, yeah. Um, I do not have one of those set up in VASP right now, though. Or on NERSC. More questions to London? John had a question. Do you have a RRR image? I do have some, but not on here. They're buried somewhere in my hundreds, hundreds of emails. <laughs> Can you dig it out? Okay. I can try to, yeah. <laughs> I'm probably, I'm going to try to calculate new ones anyway, because I'm going to try to redo these with all the coupling files now that I have them. Mm -hmm. I can get it to work. The other, the other question I had, so when you mentioned that you have basically your perovskite surface pulling up towards this quantum dot with the hydroxyls, yep. um, I, I mean, it looks like there's a clear interaction between the, the ligands and the structure of the surface. Yes. Did you ever watch like your actual dynamics videos to see once if it's just something where, you know, they're fluctuating back and forth? Um, or if you would let the optimization run longer, is it something that 
you know, like that high, the entire uh, pilot of Titan with the hydroxyls would then just kind of suck back down and the surface would level off. I mean, the bond distance would still be closer, but it would just be sort of even out. Um, I guess I didn't look at the videos, but I am also doing NCL uh, calculations on these systems, and they're they're still doing the same thing with non-collinear spin, I guess, as I keep kind of refining it. So, And I, I've seen at least multiple snapshots of those as I've been going. Um, speaking of which, my hydroxyl one keeps crashing on that, so would you be okay with helping me with that? <laughs> More questions? If no, I thank London for uh, Please collect uh, feedback and try your best to implement it. Uh, and say thank you to everyone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, you have uh, one more what? practice talk. It is a practice. Comment. For the actual talk rather than poster. Uh, oh, so we have it all. You have um, the 15 minutes. How many? 15 minutes for talk plus questions. Oh, so it's but actually 10, 10 minutes question. Uh, 10 minutes talk. My 15 or 20 minutes? Actually, yeah, yeah. Like how many hmm? minutes? Yes, 15 total. Total 15. So uh, this one is not the latest one? Uh, no, I upgraded. Okay. Do you want that someone is really kind of uh, take care for your time? Um, yeah. Probably yeah. to, to be helpful. And maybe also okay. for each slide, like mm -hmm. yeah. break it into the minutes for each slide, so he knows uh, which slide is a kilo of time or which one is really good. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Aaron Forty. I'm a graduate student at North Dakota State University and as the title uh, kind of lays out, I'm going to be talking about an atomistic study using DFT about photophysical and excited state dynamics and lead halide perovskite nanocrystals because recently we know nanocrystals, uh, lead halide perovskites in general have been used for extraordinary electronic properties for technological devices. The nanocrystals in particular have a great uh, light emitting applications, but uh, my favorite part about them is that uh, they're funding me through my PhD, basically, so. Anyway, so, yeah, so this is just an image of the uh, atomistic model that we have for our quantum belt, which we'll go into a little bit. And these are the observables that we uh, calculate for each of the models and we compare them to experiment. And overall, since we can get a radiative and non-radiative relaxation, we can get a theoretical or atomistic photoluminescence quantum yield calculation from our calculations. So, first part of the talk will just be going over so how we constructed a model for a quantum dot, because based on different sizes, you can have different surface compositions and different termination ligands. And then just briefly comment on the ground state electronic structure that we calculated for the model. And you can see, did I put it in the other image? I can't remember. I guess I did. So basically, you can see that the perovskite part of our quantum dot is basically two by two by two unit cell of the lead halide perovskite, and it's uh, fully inorganic, so it's cesium like bromide. And we terminate it with the uh, um, carboxylic, or short chain carboxylic acids for the leads, and then alkyl ammoniums for the lead bromide terminations. 
So yeah, this basically just kind of repeats some of what I said. And then, so for the uh, carboxylic acids, they terminate to the leads on the surface, so all these gray atoms. You have uh, oxygens that coordinate to passivate those, and then for systems like these, it's common that alkyl ammonium anions or cations will replace the surface cesiums. And then in the literature, it's been kind of reported that they're kind of correlated ligand pairs. So if you have, if you want good binding of your carboxylic acid, you need addition or a surplus of amines at the surface. So it's a justification for why our model makes sense. And I gotta start sending these as PDFs. My density states got kind of flipped around. <laughs> But the highlights from this is we use uh, DFT using a VASP calculations, and we use PV functional. So it's kind of generally known that if you use GGA, well, without spin orbit coupling, GGA it, and DFT gives like the correct band gap for the size. But uh, due to spin orbit coupling, we get a smaller band gap than what you'd expect for a nanoparticle this size, which is about 1.5 nanometers. But coincidentally, it turns out to be pretty much a band gap for experimentally synthesized proskite. So it's uh, so it helps for our model anyway that we have the correct band gap. Oh boy. Yeah, it looks like it's a whole consortium. Yeah. So then I was going going into a transition about so. So we generally know what the like. The atomic orbitals for the perovskites, so the conduction or the valence band is made up of the halide p orbitals and the lead s orbitals, and then the conduction band is usually a hybridization of the 6p antibonding orbitals. But I guess it's generally not known or assumed how the ligands contribute to the electronic density states. So here is a partial density of states, which I'll flip. Which shows where the ligand contributions show up. You need to be a kid. Zoom out. And then it's easier to. Oh, it's a Z. Yeah. But we, oh, we can use our imagination to follow your story. Just yeah. use words. You can invite everyone to <laughs> wait. On the shoulder and which is so I guess you can see for the valence band anyway so near the band edge which I would have labeled B here that you have so the black line is the total density states and then the colored lines are projected density states for different orbitals so for our valence band the red is the bromide 4p orbitals green is the lead 6s and then these pink I refer to just as ligand states because uh, if you add too many of the oxygen and carbon, it gets kind of convoluted. But you can see in the conduction band edge that there's this uh, so-called so -called confined whole state, and people refer to it in the literature. And then that's composed of primarily uh, bromine 6p with hybridized with uh, lead 6s orbitals. And hiding behind it, you can see that there's a little bit of hybridization with, uh, with the ligands. And in this uh, par charge density of the quantum dot here, you can kind of see that. So so if this is like your terminated P orbital, and then this is like the oxygen hybridizing with it, so that's the little bit of hybridization that's occurring in the state here. If you go further in the band edge, it follows that same trend, and then about an EV out, the 6S states start to go down, and then the ligand contributions start to go up. And those, I guess I haven't fully looked into it yet, but I'm guessing that they're bromine amine uh, mm -hmm. orbitals because since the lead states are going away, like you wouldn't have carboxylic acids binding to the surface leads. And conduction band, it's basically 6p orbitals like make up most of the states for within one EV range and then past an EV there's a like a skyrocketing of ligand states that contribute mostly in that in those in that region of the states. So we have the ground state electronic structure, and we use that as input for our dynamics calculations. So first I'm going to be talking about hot carrier cooling, where we can get our K cooling rate as after we do a photo excitation in the system. So we excite based on oscillator strengths, which I haven't talked about yet. And then we can calculate the cooling rate from the photo excite state 
down to the band edge, and then from the band edge, it's, we can calculate the non-radiative relaxation rates. And to do this, we do it uh, on, using an on-the-fly procedure. So we do molecular dynamics, and then along the molecular dynamics trajectory, we compute uh, non-adiabatic bad couplings between states, like on the fly. And we use uh, spinner orbitals for this, which is a, like our computational highlight for, for this work. I could have a better transition there, but so basically, to describe the computational aspect that we contribute, or the updated part that we contribute to this, is we introduce spin orbit coupling into the non radiative relaxation. So just to highlight, or give a brief highlight of how what makes this different is, if you consider like a closed shell configuration, you only, if you consider like non radiative relaxation from LUMO plus two to LUMO, you have three possible transitions. You have LUMO plus two to plus one, plus one to LUMO, and then plus two to LUMO. And then, and say if you're dealing with something that needs to be spin polarized, like transition metal, you would want to do a spin polarized calculation to get that pure electronic structure. And basically you have the same outline because these are spin conserved transitions, or spin polarized calculations anyway. So basically you still have the same transitions, you just have double of them. So instead of three, you get six. And if you do non-collinear calculations, you can get possible spin flip transitions between all the states. So effectively what you do when you do non-collinear, or include non-collinear in your excise state calculations is you effectively increase like your density of states window. And generally when you increase the density of states, that's going to impact the non-radiative rates because it gives you additional pathways. And if you take this chart here that we outlined, you can outline, you can characterize each of these transitions into a matrix, matrix like we've shown here. So both of the axes are transitions between LUMO orbitals. So LUMO plus zero to plus zero is nothing because we just define that as a transition to itself is zero. But then you can do LUMO plus one to zero, which would, in a spin polarized case, would be spin forbidden. But in NCL, with spin orbit coupling, that opens up that transition. And then you can also have spin conserving, or what would normally be spin conserving plus two to LUMO, or plus three, LUMO plus three, LUMO plus one. And you can do the same thing throughout the whole table. But then if you take this chart and you just rotate it, and imagine those bars are amplitudes, those will give you transition rates, a uh, uh, three-dimensional matrix, or like a tensor, describing relaxation rates for all the states. So this chunk up here is basically transition between all LUMO states, and then this square here is same idea, but it's just for uh, almost states or pulse occupations. And we compute them using a uh, state to state transition. So basically, we take our non adiabatic couplings from a trajectory, do autocorrelation functions, and then take Fourier transforms of them. And essentially, that gives us our non radiative rates between states. And just from doing that, we can get our non radiative relaxation rate from across the gap. And our calculations give us about 0.84 inverse nanoseconds. And I, don't know, I was looking in literature, there's not, I couldn't find a lot reported on non radiative relaxation for nanocrystals, like direct measurements. But there are people who do, like, they do photoluminescence quantum yields and they compare before and after. So if you have a 100% luminescence quantum yield, you can kind of backtrack and get estimate what your non radiative rates are. And they estimate them to be within this range, depending, like 0.001 to 0 0.01 uh, inverse nanoseconds for... So much, much slower an experiment. Yes, for if you have a good emitting quantum dot or something with low surface trap stage. But on experiment, the LQ chains are much longer. Yes. Not expected contribution to the structure. But, the but your low state is optically active? Yes. So, I guess compared to experiment, our non radiative relaxation rate is a little bit high. And I guess I do have one theory behind that, which I'll get to at the end of it, or one explanation why for this system anyway. And then you can also characterize certain trends within the Redfield tensor. But basically, just the highlight is if you have degenerate states, you have a resonance condition, so you have fast transitions. And anything not resonant, you get the 
you have slower transition rates between states. So if you just project like this, uh, the possible homo states into 2D, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So you have fast, degenerate, and then slow, non-degenerate states. And, and for your, uh, this is again the rate. You're getting this 0, 0, 1 to 0, 1. This number here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is... If it's rate, then it's again should be not nanoseconds, but reverse nanoseconds. The, the right. pin should be read like divide symbol. Yeah, ah. that should be divide. That's probably just a typo. So that's yeah, that's definitely one. In, that's inverse nanoseconds. And so, so these provide transition rates between all of our states, but we also have to define an initial condition because since we're doing a dynamics, we have to specify where we start from. And this kind of turned around again, but basically, we. Based on oscillator strength, the, one of the strongest transitions is from this peak here to about half an EV into the conduction band. So, which are labeled, so our whole initial state is HOMO minus nine and electron state is NUMA plus 10. And so for this green figure here, this kind of outlines the energy relaxation of the peroxide quantum dot after photo excitation. So you have a photo excitation, electron, NUMA minus 10, whole Homo minus nine, and during the trajectory, it's uh, you have different op energy occupations. So these orange colors indicate an increase of what of energy occupying these states, and then this uh, blue line indicates it, like decreasing of whole energy in time, and then the black lines indicate uh, expectation values. Population of uh, energy and time. So, for this analysis, we assume uh, we can fit it to an exp a single exponential rate, which for systems like this is probably not the best case because, like we introduced earlier, we introduced spin orbit coupling, which introduces additional relaxation pathways. And you also have an uh, organic inorganic interface, which is going to, uh, it's not going to follow the conventional gap law because it's not a single material in itself. So well, before I move on, so just to comment on uh, our computed cooling rates compared to experiments. So the couple of experiments I've seen reported for cooling rates, they both give about 300 inverse picoseconds, or not 300, three inverse picoseconds. Which would correspond to about 300 uh, femtoseconds. 300 femtoseconds, yeah, that's both, both important. And those are pretty close for our electron hole cooling rates for these systems. See, with the same order of magnitude, so its uh, error is about like 50 percent. Mm -hmm. But you talk about different size in this case, right? Different size, yeah. They would deal with like a bulk ensemble, and this is a 1.5 nanometer. And, and, and the experimental? What's the radius of that? So the like word like reported means experimental. Yeah, yeah experimental and they, uh, How big is their systems? Probably like 9 nanometer. Oh, wow. Nine. So, it's so there's a size difference, but I guess the biggest difference between these systems would be a surface coverage of ligand. Now, yes, the electron density too, or a little bit more overlap, but mm -hmm. if you assume that they're confined, like independent of size, they should have about the same if you, they're passivated. But confinement actually should be dependent on size. If they're not confined, then there's no confinement effect. I right, mean, if there's guess, no size dependency, it means no confinement effect. I guess I, <laughs> maybe I used it in the wrong language. So, well, the charge is spread out in more, but you quantum shouldn't. dot language, right? So people usually say whether it's really confinement or no confinement, whether it's in a strong confinement, medium confinement, kind of intermediate regime, or no confinement regime, or weak confinement regime, right? Mm -hmm. So they consider the size compared with a so-called exciton bore radius, means uh, the size of your exciton, in other words, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know is it the same language ap applicable here, because again, electron hole pair is considered more like a free electron hole pair, right? Uh, uh, not very much coupled, not very strong. Mm -hmm. Which would be sim which would simulate like bulk or like large nano crystals, because at like nine nanometers, they're weakly confined or intermediate confined. So when, when what they call in the report, so there's so means the size of like exciton bore radius is something around so it's seven ten, nanometers. Seven nanometers. Seven so nanometers it's really for big, these okay. systems, yeah. So, so it's not a gross approximation to use independent orbitals. 
for cooling rings. So there's not a big excitonic effect. For the ones they looked at in the literature anyway, if they put an ensemble. And so, so I put it in a slide because I know we've had a lot of debate about single exponential fits for our data. So I took, oh man. So it's not going to look as pretty, but we can kind of get the same idea. So what I've plotted is exponential fits for our dimensionless energy during the relaxation trajectory. So that's the top panel. And then the bottom one is like the PDOS occupations in time. And this figure was supposed to be like, the density of states that were part of the transitions. So basically what we can see is, so this is our a photo excited electron. So this corresponds to this yellow curve here. We just normalize it, so the intensity, x intensity is 1. So the black curve is what we computed for energy relaxation along the trajectory. And then the red dotted line is a single exponential fit. And so we can glean a couple of things just from comparing our computed results relative to that single exponential fit. So we can see that earlier in the trajectory, it's about slightly slower relaxation up to like 0.7 of its energy. And then in this region here, it starts to pick up or go, like increase faster than single exponential fit. And then near the band gap, like this, kind of, this tail goes on to slightly above the zero or one picosecond because this is log scale. So we can see the closer you get to the gap that the relaxation dramatically slows down. And I tried to correlate that with like where the electron density is occupied in time. So this pink line is this PV success orbitals. So this is like the inside the perovskite. And these two lines here are the only other two states that have provided significant electron density. So it's the carbon 2p atoms and then oxygen 2p from the ligands. Here we can see if this was scaled correctly before that there is a little bit of electron contribution, like up to the points where this fast relaxation happens, or, it's, or this density starts to dissipate at about the same time that this dissipates. So it seems like that the that there are some I don't know what words I'm looking for. So there are vibrational modes from this aspect here that help drive quicker relaxation. So this uh, time resolved PDOS of which uh, orbital or which range of energies? So this is the electron, and this is from no no the lower lower uh, oh. this one. So this is over the same exact trajectory. For which uh, orbital or for which range of energies? What, what, what are the lines? So they're basically occupations. So I took <coughs> occupations of bands, and then I projected the, the bands instead okay. of it being occupied one. It's just partial occupations. So like say this is HOMO, initially it's... So it is occupation of each orbital weighted by P uh, projection character of, of, yes. of the same orbital. Okay. So at the initial excitation, you have a little bit of less electron density on the 6p orbitals and a little bit more. So this is our initial condition, LUMO plus 10. Okay. And along the trajectory, it relaxes to LUMO, where electron density comes from the ligand like back into the quantum dot. It's not highly resolved because there's not a lot of it's probably only 3%. Okay, so at a, at a latest stage of relaxation, ligands contribute less 
to to the process. Right. And my thinking was that the like whatever the electron density occupied on the carbon, like it's getting some either carbon carbon stretch or CO stretch contributions to the non abiotic couplings. And that's what kind of drives the quicker relaxation here. Because I've done this for a couple of initial conditions, and this is the only region where I ever really see quicker relaxation relative to the single exponential. And that's really the only occupation where there's been significant electron density, like not on the oxygen, but on carbons of the ligands. And then there's just another the note too. So in this region down here where there's a really slow relaxation, that's been observed experimentally. It was for a different system, it was for iodine based, but they observed within 0.2 EV of the, above the conduction band, there were spectral signatures like later in time. So mm -hmm. it indicates that there was a buildup of electron population, which is kind of what we see here because there's, it's a sparse density of states, so it's probably like 0.2 EV, like subgaps due to the strong spin orbit coupling in the conduction band, so. Yeah, if it looked really nice, it would have looked a lot better, but or would, hopefully it would have made more sense. So, and then this is just visualization of everything I've been talking about for the past five minutes. But I think this one gets, oh, this video works. Oh, the video must be saved on this desktop. No, so it's, it's now it's more than 51 minutes. Well, I tried it earlier on my computer and it didn't work. But it's changing. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so so this is our initial condition, LUMO plus 10 and uh, HOMO minus 9. So the LUMO plus 10 occupied states are like the orange or reddish orbitals are contributing on the outside. So there's like 6P. And then the blue orbitals is like your bromine P orbitals. So you can see the whole, there's a little bit of hybridization on the ligands. And this is what I was talking about earlier with a little bit of carbon, or electron density onto the carbon for the, helps promote the electron relaxation. In case you kind of see it's hybridized with this 6p orbital. So as we progress this video forward, so you can see some of the states changing. And here you can see electron migrating, or the density migrating from the ligand. And everything kind of comes back into the center of the perovskite, where this transition here is like electron density going into the central lead, which is a 6s orbital, so that's why it looks spherical. And then on the edges, you can see the bromine p orbitals occupied, and then for the electron, they're occupied on the lead 6p. I tried to update it so that it would like partial charge density like along the trajectory. I wasn't able to get that done for today. And I had intention to fill this slide out more, but I didn't get around to it. So basically this is just getting our K radiative so we can complete the three observables we were looking for. So we use uh, basically uh, Einstein coefficients to get our, uh, well those give us relaxation or radiative recombination rates. So you can get lifetimes from just taking the inverse. And we do this with spin, spin orbitals too, so our transition dipoles are computed in a spin orbit coupling basis. And I haven't filled this chart out either, but basically we can compute time resolved emission along our excited state trajectory, which we described earlier. So this is describing uh, radiative relaxation across the trajectory. So initially at uh, time equals zero, we have a photo absorption. And then at the early stages of the time, we have low energy transitions, which give off just infrared heat to transition. And then eventually the system relaxes to the band edge and you get bright PL, which is this line here, where it starts to emit so this integrates the time results. So from our oscillator strengths calculations, we find we get a radiative recombination rate of about 0.4 inverse nanoseconds, which is on, about on the scale of what's been reported in the literature by theory and uh, experiment. So an experiment, depending on 
I guess it varies depending on the resolution of the instrument you have, but normally they, at room temperature, they give between one and 10 inverse nanoseconds. And then recently there's been a big nature paper that describes the, that uh, describe, or predicts rate of recombination rates based on size of the nanocrystals, and ours would fall into, I guess ours is even a little smaller than what they predicted. The lowest number they gave was like four nanometers, and they predicted that would be at about like have a lifetime of about one nanometer, or not nanometer, nanosecond. So it falls within the same order of magnitude of what we compute. And so with this, we got a radiative rate, which we converted to a lifetime, which is 2.35 nanoseconds. And same for the non radiative, we can plug it into our photoluminescence quantum yield, and we get uh, a little bit lower than what's seen in an experiment, even for like bad perovskite samples, so 33%. Like you can initially make them for about 50%. So our computations are off a little bit and that's mostly due to our non-radiative relaxation being likely over, overestimated a little bit. And one reason for this is it's been uh, hypothesized that uh, the Rashba effect uh, slows down non-radiative relaxation across the gap due to uh, kind of like a you need a phone on assisted spin flip, or you need not account just for energy across the gap, but you also need to account for phone on mode, which is, um, I guess it's not a very strong effect for perovskite nanocrystals, but it could be enough to, to slow our rates down a little bit. And then for our cooling and our radiative rates, they fall within roughly the same order of magnitude as seen in experiment. So, and then, Acknowledgements, I haven't filled this in yet, but funding, <laughs> primary one. And yeah, that should be, that is it. Okay, let's thank Aaron. So, uh, John and Braden, uh, if you have questions, ask first because uh, connection can be broken in uh, three minutes. <laughs> they didn't expect. It was hard to follow. No, I'm space. good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay. Could you again explain the difference, I mean, not the difference, the way how you calculate the non radiative relaxation uh, recombination time? Not relaxation, recombination time. Recombination time? So I just come straight from the non adiabatic couplings. Or once we process the non adiabatic couplings. Are you, using, are you using like exponential feet into your data or anything? Because mm, you that's what that rate is. Huh? That's what yeah, that's so that's a single exponential that okay. we fit to the data. So it's already include this uh, exponential single exponential behavior, mm -hmm. which looks like it's an approximation. I understand. Time. But it's already showing the difference, like you're showing the deviation between next slide. This one? No. Where you comparing the exponential decay versus oh, this, uh, one. this one, right? So it means you're already showing that actually it's not exactly exponential trend. Right. Is it also, uh, but it probably depends on where you excite. But it, you said like it's the same features for your home aluma transitions as well? Or oh, this is uh, only for the <coughs> interband transitions? So this yeah, is the used method for home aluma transition will show literally single exponential decay because uh, between two states there is, there is nothing else at least with the, with, in this approximation yeah. so uh, what uh, Aaron is reporting is uh, not a fit to single exponential it's just a rate it's a non adiabatic coupling score for uh, so it's transition so it's the number coming right out of our red field tensor so this approach but can you yes. can you really kind of use this estimation based on your uh, dynamics without calculating the uh, the rates? 
but just knowing your non-diabetic couplings, right, um, and kind of fitting it with exponential, and just using the fitting function and check how the k in your exponential function will be agreeing or not agreeing with this uh, uh, radical tensor. It can be done, but in some sense, it uh, all of this processing of non-diabetic couplings is included into this uh, M symbol. It's basically average of uh, non adiabatic couplings along the trajectory. Oh, okay. More questions? Uh, there is a hope that there were some written questions on the uh, oh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was lost somewhere. You, 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 you said that you calculate your couplings with including the spin orbit couplings, right? Yes. But do you have calculations without, like, and somewhere in your conclusions you're saying that the rates would be faster if you include the spin orbit, but you already include the spin orbit. Or rush by, rush by effect, whatever this effect. So what is, what is needed to, uh, um, you do have spin orbit, but you do not have rush. Right. You oh, have then I don't understand what is rush by effect. So rush by effect is, it's coupling, like if you have a charge dish, in dish, if you don't have equal to like charge distribution, like in your crystal, it's going to create some sort of magnetic dipole, and that couples with uh, electronic structure. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know the exact mechanism. So you're going to have induced magnetic uh, field. Yeah. And and that couples with the spin. Yeah. So basically, what it, like, I can draw a picture of it. Mm -hmm. So. Like but why is it? You said you said that this rush by effect would increase. It would decrease. Slow down. The it should slow down because this is usually like your dispersion band. What rush by effect does is it splits, makes it spin dependent. So it, so if this is like your spin up, and then spin down, mm -hmm. and it does that for both bands. So, and I think it like switches the spin indices too. So you would need a. You're gonna fit an additional channel. Right. Huh. So you need a little additional energy corresponding to the splitting of your momentum. I see. Which we might be able to do one day since Fatima figured out how to do uh, uh, couplings between k points. Yeah, for everyone needs k points. So we need to put together both spin orbit and k points. Mm -hmm. It's a fancy but uh, you also have calculations. You didn't show it, but I remember your previous calculations. You also have your dynamics without spin orbit coupling, or you mm -hmm. don't? I do. Like just with how it calls spin fixed, uh, yeah. spin uh, restricted. Uh, restricted, yes. So, uh, and then your rates, how much then they are different? Spin versus no spin. Mm -hmm. Especially if we, I know, I remember you, you're changing the band gap significantly with the spin orbit coupling, right? Band gap changes, I think, the cooling rates, they were, they're the same order of magnitude. They're like factor of two, factor of four different. Mm -hmm. uh, slow. By some reason, think, uh, with, uh, oh, with, with spin orbit, it gets slower, right? I'd have to double check, it's been a while. Since but I this is kind of interesting, I would definitely add this. You don't need to really make a big uh, kind of you know, discussion on it, but somewhere at the end you can compare these results with your spin without spin orbit and spin orbit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's a good idea. I just couldn't find a natural way to put it in. But I guess I can... Very natural, can just say like... Backups and right. if we, yeah. like, like you, you can always mention our main feature is including spin orbit. Uh, if someone neglects spin orbit coupling, then so here is a calculation done without this, and we see the very significant, like, well, significant, not significant, twice or three times difference, like, mm -hmm. either this way or that way. Mm -hmm. Which again, probably brings a uh, very important conclusion to your final conclusion that you really need spin orbit calculations for mm -hmm. getting this accurately. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, or the biggest difference would be this feature here. We can actually see it. Mm -hmm. So it's without spin orbit, it's a you have a denser s amount of space near the band edge, mm -hmm. where with spin orbit, it, it's like Most 0.1, 0.2 EV. Most between, right? Yeah, so that, so your decay is going to be different. 
So it's going to be faster near the band edge for that electronic burst spin restricted compared to spin orbit. And again, you might add the line here if you have it, or just maybe yeah. some data, just numbers, right, for the rates or something like this. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's a good idea to just put it into here. Or average non-orbital couplings, up, up to like there are either rates or couplings or really kind of illustration for for for, for quicker uh, bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, for quicker <laughs> ages of this uh, of this uh, curves. Mm -hmm. well, that definitely makes sense. Does it make sense to do PDOS with this? I didn't get it at all. <laughs> I got it, but it is not self-evident. Yeah. yeah, and plus I'm, I'm confused what is your x-axis in this case. So it's time. Energy? So it's time. How's and time is negative? Oh, it's log. Log, log time. Log. Log time. Uh, yeah, the axis got cut off. So is, it, is it a reason to put time in the log format? Hmm? If it's really straight lines, you can just make it. Like nothing really happens. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what, what would be uh, much easier to, big, big, big uh, uh, much more di digestive is instead of putting Your call uh, will be minus, disconnected. minus three, put... Bye-bye, guys. Bye, John. Bye, Brian. Um, so you can put, instead of minus three, uh, put the um, uh, one picosecond. Instead of minus two, put ten picoseconds. Instead of... Minus one, put 100 picoseconds, mm -hmm. or 50 seconds. In where, where you have zero, put one picosecond. Mm -hmm. like so still it, it is have still, log still time, log scale, but, but you scale it, will it be not one to three, but uh, actual time mm -hmm. scale. Okay. Makes sense, yeah. It's kind of hard to resolve on there because it's wait, such wait, a little, wait, wait, wait. but for the PDOS I was talking about, oh. maybe I just have to but zoom in on the carbon oxygen. I mean, I understand that you're making a, an important point, but but honestly, I I, I completely miss it. Like, what, how exactly this representation explains this deviation from exponential curve? I mean, I, I got the main message, but I I was lost in the details. Like, how exactly it works, I didn't get it. Yeah, so this is more just like a correlation. Like, I would need like the spectral density to show that there's this vibration happening here. And you can see it's mm -hmm. causing dissipation of this carbon density. Put, put a maybe, equation. How did you compute it? Like, why not okay. put the phonon spectra? Right? You, 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 I mean, you, can, you can also prove it with a spectra of phonons, right? To show that you have this phonons contributing, this CC over ever stretching phonons contributing there. Yeah, that's what I was trying Coupled. to get. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get for the presentation, but I don't know, I was struggling, so I just. Oh, you don't have the. Stuff. You don't have. Like how, many, how many atoms and how many electrons do you have in your system? A uh, thousand atoms and like about three or But you just do Fourier electrons. transform and see it where the peaks. Like, have you done Fourier transform <laughs> of your of your trajectory, electronic state? Uh, I've tried, but I couldn't get the data. Or I couldn't make sense of the data I got. So, like, you're getting no peaks. You're getting something like completely. Yeah, it seems kind of like noise. I couldn't noise without really clear. Yeah, so peaks. I have to play with the Fourier transform parameters. Try to make sense of it. But I mean, it has to be there because you saw in the image. Like right away, there's like there's density, like 2p coming out of the carbon atom. So there's got to be at least a little bit of coupling from one of those stretching vi vibrations. So maybe Aaron needs to practice once again, and since we have, uh, there will be more posters to, to be printed on, uh, not tomorrow, but coming Wednesday. Right? And since you, it, your presentation is not a poster, you can practice on Friday just before the departure. Last Friday before the, the, before the meeting. Mm -hmm. That works. More questions to Aaron? The total time was around 28, 29 minutes. Oh, just shorter twice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, took. there were some uh, interruptions due to the technical, uh, technical problems. You, you, you know, you can, you can um, make screenshot for each slide and uh, make your slides un uneditable, just as one big figure, bitmap figure that uh, not of several objects, but screenshot on each slide. Mm -hmm. and then it's guaranteed that it will be seen on any system. 
I'll have to do that for next time. And this is supposed to be a movie, right? For your for the slide which you just Yeah. Showed. But the movie did work. The movie worked. Well, right. on this uh -huh. computer anyway. It was? The I movie did work, yes. Something was moving? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, play the movie once again. What exactly was moving? And f index with your finger. I see the numbers are changing, but I don't see anything is moving. So time is updating. So no, I understand this, updated. but what is really moving in a, in a movie? <laughs> so is the electron is migrating the from the lead p orbitals to in another adjacent p orbitals on this state. Mm -hmm. And you can see for the blue, those are the holes. So you see over time, they feel like the, this bromine p. So they increase in blue, they becoming more blue or what? Yeah, so. The darker the color, the more intense the population. I didn't see. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. yeah. So there's not a lot of color. Able to see? Wow. <laughs> Is the color changing there? So you can see, like right, like very dark. It's like highly populated because that's our initial condition. So everything's kind of contrast to that. So it's not as dark. But you see, electron density leaving. to follow because if I'm looking on the wrong air then nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. Well if you look at the center one something eventually eventually happens. Okay. Okay. I don't know why I was looking really on the bottom line. <laughs> nothing really happens with the bottom. So you can you can uh, t tell it uh, without hesitation like I invite everyone to carefully focus on this no, mm -hmm. and, and I also was expecting that you really will show the thermal motion of your lattice. Oh, okay. But no, no. Well, well you, you can put it um, on your title slide while you are introducing who you are and what are you doing. It may play on the background. Yeah, that's for a good idea. For entertainment. Mm -hmm. oh. Done? More questions one, more questions two, more questions three. But thank you. Okay. Um, so, give him uh, feedback if, if any, and many thanks for to everyone for uh, contributing okay. to the to the meeting and discussion. Meeting is dismissed. See you on Friday. Okay. And who is presenting on Friday? Oh. According to the schedule, anyone? Please call post to Ben. What is our old schedule? No. no? I don't know. Jabot? Did you present on your research update? No. no. My one is following me, I guess. Okay, let's uh, figure it out and distribute it.